So we're back. It's another episode of Better Learning Podcast. I'm excited about talking with Jeremy Leffring here today. And before I pull him in, I just want to give a little bit of context. Um, most of you know that I also own K-12, which is a school furniture distributor, one, and we work nationwide. Um, I don't talk about it a lot on the show, but a lot of um, the things that we get involved with is really the impact on the space. And Jeremy and his company with Foam Core, we worked together and I've gotten to know him. And I thought it'd be really interesting to pull him in and have some conversation, get to know kind of the people behind behind the products in this industry, um, but then also get into uh, the aspect that I think Jeremy is really going to like talk about. It's the mission behind why we do what we do. Um, and his company is very unique. And that's why I really want to bring in. So enough of me talking about you, Jeremy. Come on in. Good to see you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me on today. So what kind of sparked this is, you know, we, you know, we've gotten to know each other at a personal level here and as our companies work together. And I think we have a very shared kind of mission, passion to what we do of like improving education. But then, but beyond that, of really like the people that we interact with, why don't you give a little bit of your history to sure. give some context of like how you got into this this business and and kind of what your personal story is to get you to this point yeah awesome thank you yeah my dad actually started a foam fabricating company back in 1983 which is kind of a funny unique i don't know weird thing to grow up in mm. but he uh i'm the second of eight kids and he was laid off from pouring iron you know muskegon's uh manufacturing town the, the town that foam cores in and i grew up here and so uh, he had to pivot. And so he started fabricating foam and it was like mattress foam and, you know, football equipment. So I kind of grew up with, you know, the buns of foam, which are like, the, you know, the big raw foam and scrap foam piles to play in. And so, yeah, as I got older, um, got to school. Uh, did he have like interest in foam before that? Like, I, I think it's fascinating to go from iron to to foam. Was, so, was that, did that seem like a big leap or was that oh, kind it was of a huge, natural? Oh, it was a huge leap. Yeah. In fact, um, he started, so think in 1983, he was big in video, videoing everything our family did. In fact, he had like the big VHS on the shoulder. Yeah, the, yes. yeah, the big VHS and, and the VCR in the bag. Oh, know, yes. All the wires, but only the newscasters had armrests. So he actually invented a process in which he connected foam to the plastic, like a self-skinning foam. And uh, that's what he got into. He started making these. And uh, it's funny. I watched the video of that. They, they did an interview with the local news. Um, and, you know, my dad's younger than me at, at the point of the video was going on. And, um, yeah, he ended up selling that patent to Sears or Sears subsidiary. And he started foam fabricating after that. So the foam part that got him interested was just you know how business works sometimes like there's a need i got this big heavy thing i'm carrying around and um if you remember back then too you had to really stabilize the camera they didn't have those internal yeah. so right the camera rest really helped that was kind of his thing is you could do this on a all I yeah, all I think of is like our home videos like if i look back in like the early 80s like when we had videos we had we we took a vacation to cape cod and we had about an hour recorded of this video and like 57 minutes of it was my dad putting the lens cap on it and yes. not, not turning off the recording. <laughs> and it's just the sound of us walking. <laughs> yeah. That's so funny. I remember having the video going and it's, it's displaying at the same time on the TV. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, we're kind of aging ourselves, but yeah, that was kind of like, that's what I grew up in uh, entrepreneur kind of spirit. Um, so foam core is sort of the product of that yeah so so i think it's interesting um that you because you you got into like other pro you weren't mainly focused on education at first well no you, you know what when i i graduated with an education and theology degree so i taught for five years so i actually thought of foam products and made foam products because i was doing sort of an alternative pe um, for for kids that had different kind of handicaps. And so it was a way to help them learn how, you know, some some movements, some safe movements. And so I was like kind of making these things on the side early on, like uh, my student teaching, you know, I went to my dad's shop and I cut up a bunch of phone blocks 
And we were literally just teaching the kids to maybe stack the foam and knock it over and just fun, simple motor skills at a, at a real, you know, kind of fun PE level. So um, that actually was the start of foam core way back then. Oh, you know? that's cool. And that would have been what the early 2000, like 2000, okay. 2001. And then I taught up to 2007. So, you know, it was, uh, it kind of, you know, kind of came out of that whole whole experience is how can I think of things really PE related? So you'll notice like one of the original pieces that we did was the beam, uh, the balance beam set. Okay. And so it was on the ground. It was foam and kids could walk on it at a pretty good platform. And then if they fell, they were falling on foam. So they weren't hurt. So, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. And so then you, you've evolved in, in a lot of ways, like quickly. Yes, because because you're doing that, and then you know, I mean, going and seeing the factory and hearing, you know, like, because what year did did you officially start Foam Core? So we officially started Foam Core in 2016, and we hired our first employees in 2017. So from 2007, when I stopped teaching, up to then, it was really my wife and I, um, kind of trying to make it work with bean bags. So we did a lot in youth room, youth rooms, or or community centers. And we would go to all those trade shows and bring these big foam filled beanbag chairs. And uh, then it was like 2015, I think I partnered with uh, Jeff Sack, who's my business partner now. And we had this idea, let's go back kind of to some of these, some of these, you know, parts from back in the day. And um, yeah, by the end of 2017, I had eight employees and I was like, what is going on? You know, like we we've arrived and now I, I just got a report today. We have 170 employees. And- yeah. That that's so cool to see that growth. And, and I, I mean, a lot of it is you, you hit the right time because I, I got into this industry in 2009 and like some of the newer products, you know, like even ones that are kind of made in your backyard, like steel, I would say steel case. So it was really yeah. one of the ones that, that really brought some research and tried to take some fresh eyes into the K-12 market. Um, and there were all these, you know, just new things coming out of saying, Hey, maybe we don't have to do straight rows anymore. And, um, yeah, so, so it, it, yeah. it's been really cool to see the evolution of it. And then obviously to see you guys kind of going in with the, with kind of this creative kind of servant mindset. You know, it's, it's funny because all four of our regional sales directors, were in some way in education. One was uh, teaching and a coach. One was a pastor and a and a teacher. One, the other one was a teacher. The other one was in education, um, sales side of things, products and furniture and things. They all had this sort of education background. Uh, but you touched on something there that that I love. Um, today we were just talking to somebody in the shop, uh, one of the guys, and he said, "You know, I love that that um, yes, we make furniture, but we're here with a bigger purpose." And that was just a guy who's it's Sean on the upholstery. And I love that. I think, I think it was Sean. Anyway, we, we were just chatting about that. It's like, it's this bigger thing. And um, we could be here to make furniture. We could be here to upholster or package. Um, but, you know, foam core is built on the idea that we want to bless others. I say this all the time. I really think our team is talented enough and has a heart in such a way we could do anything. We could make anything. We could. Produ- we happen to do furniture, but on the day to day, the goal is: Can I bless the guy next to me? Can I bless the school and the classroom and the student that this ends up going into? That's why we're here. And uh, uh, it really changes on a hot July or J- late June day <laughs> near Lake Michigan, where it's humid and we've got smoke from Canada coming at us right now. I mean, it's is that still going on? Oh, it is. Oh, man. And so the doors are closed and it's a little hotter in the shop and you walk around and people are like, we're blessing somebody today. And what does that look like? Um, yeah, it's pretty cool. So that doesn't just happen. Yeah. Give, give a little context of like, yeah. did, did you always think like, Hey, when I, you know, like when I start a business or grow a business, like, like, w- was there a plan? Was it organic? Yeah. Like, what, like, tell me a little bit of that. Yeah. A little of both. Right. I mean, um, Everything's philosophical when it's, you know, two in the morning and you're sitting at the sewing machine, you know, alone, sewing something, thinking in the future what a business could look like. It's all philosophical. So you have this idea. I remember 
um, a friend of mine bought us co uh, like uh, coaching sessions with a business coach. He gave it to me because I clearly needed it. And uh, <laughs> very kind. But my wife and I sat down and I remember him asking me, like, what's your goal? And I said, I'd love to hire 10 people. It's hard to have a job, you know, in Muskegon, employ unemployment was up. I'd love to hire 10 people who can support their families in my company. It's like, well, that's nice. But and that's nice to go. But I'm talking more like a financial goal. And I'm like, well, I don't even I just want to make sure I've got enough money that we're paying the bills, but that we can support 10 people. And I think it was born out of that. It is that idea that money cannot be the driver or you are an empty vessel. You know, it's an empty company. You, you, I want to do something more. And of course, you know, I taught, I got an education degree because I want to impact kids. I've coached, I, was, I will start, I hate to even say this out loud, but my 28th straight year of coaching, mm -hmm. of coach soccer and basketball uh, for the most part. And I want to impact these kids, you know, and want to impact these students to be go from being, you know, boys to men and girls to women and learning life lessons. And um, I actually really pressed against the business was growing and things. I pressed against that. I didn't want it to get in the way of my, my mission until I recognized that as of today, I have 170, you know, uh, people that are my mission that have become yeah. part of it. And it's very much like coaching or teaching. It's like, how do you bless them? How do you come around them? You know? Yeah. And hearing you talk, um, you know, I, I relate to that a lot, but I, I think the perception, and I guess I want to get your take on this. Do, do you think the perception is the reality of that? Like most business owners or entrepreneurs are like, are just kind of profit focused, greedy, like just trying to like do that. Or, or do you feel like there, there are a lot of just like, people that are just generally wanting to do good. I think, I, I think, especially the competition and the people that are in our industry that I know, I think generally really do want to do good. I really do. I think they want to do good. I think they want to be good to the people around them. I think they want to, um, you know, have good relationships with the dealers and the end user. I think this is just a, a, a little bit different because the goal really is, um, I usually use the word we're in the ministry of business. This is a way to take care of people and help push them towards better, a better life. Um, we want it to be this safe place. Again, very much like my classroom or very much like the field when they're on the field. This is, this has got to be that oasis. And we will do that to the point of, um, if I'm losing money doing it, we'll do it as long as we can and we'll find something else to do when it doesn't work. You do have to have money. It's the fuel. My partner, Jeff, always says, that's the fuel in which you can do these things for people. Um, but neither Jeff nor myself are gouging the company of money for our own personal gain at the expense of um, helping other people. Yeah. And, and give some examples because I have some that I, that I can share from going through it because there, there's some people where it's like, that's the talk, but sure. it doesn't make it into like the culture. Like the people don't may not feel that way, even though there may be a mission statement or something walking through your factory, you feel it, um, it through those interactions. Um, the, the things that you're talking about and you hear from everyone, you know, that's, that's cutting fabric to, to, uh, shaping the foam. Like it's coming from the, are, are you hiring for that? Like how, how did that, how does that happen? How does that culture create yeah. that type of environment? Yeah, no, it, you do hire for it in the sense of, um, leadership. You, 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 for example, if you want to move up in leadership, we're very driven to bring the people that are in our building now into the leadership positions. Our goal is to grow people here. And one of the first questions we're going to ask is how have, that's the first thing on Kelsey, our HR director's questionnaire. How do you show justice, kindness, and humility? Those are our core values. How have you done that? And people know that's going to be what's asked. They're going to give examples. And so I think it's driven in every part. When you move up, how do you move up? You do it by showing those things. A couple of cool examples. Um, uh, Laura, who runs our phone room, um, her husband needs help. He's gone through some health issues. And so she goes home for lunch 
um, and brings them lunch every day. Well, there are other teammates that will bring two lunches so that she has a lunch to bring. And it happens Mm -hmm. very regularly. Um, It is this atmosphere. We say, you know, you may spend half the hours of your week in these walls. We're going to make it this pleasant thing and we're going to do this life together. And uh, another kind of neat story, my my daughter, my, I have two, uh, four kids, two girls, two boys, they all are working here this summer um, and they're learning how to work, which is fantastic. <laughs> but she was sitting there and she came home and told me that she said one girl was being trained on how to sew and she was sewing vinyl. She says, well, what happens? She, her words were, who yells at you when you mess up a product? And the lady says back to her, just appear, says, oh, can't yell at people here. You have to be kind. Hmm. And I thought that's where it happens. It happens through, yes, your leadership and you're trying to be an example of it. You're trying to encourage it, but it really happens when there's buy-in from the people and they're saying, oh no, you got to be just kind and humble here. Um, so it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it is. And it's honestly, like, I feel like it's like the currency to success in, in, the, in our era right now. Um, I mean, I, I tell the story a lot of like, you know, when we started out, we were, we were in survival mode. I mean, mm-hmm. first, uh, legitimately four or five years, it was just like, literally we would, you know, I had a business part when we started and be like, all right, what's our plan for the year? And we, the first two years, literally it was the top was survive. Like, <laughs> like that was our goal for the first couple of years. And, you know, and then, you know, you just try to get to that point and, once we did kind of have our transformation, we'd be like, oh man, what we're doing actually matters. Mm-hmm. That shifted everything, but okay. not, not, and this is where I'm talking like selfishly, like I didn't want to work somewhere where it was just like about the money and selling yeah. stuff. Uh, like to me, like it was as much or more for me as it was for our, the rest of our team and our culture to kind of be around there and be like, oh, the mission, like what we're doing is impacting education. And that's the mission. Um, and, you know, like this literally is not about money. Like we, yeah. and we regularly walk away from jobs if we feel like we're not adding any value or we're not making it a better learning environment. Mm-hmm. And, and that's, uh, it, it seems foreign to other people, but it, I can't imagine it any other way now that we've been doing it. Yeah. People say to me all the time, are you going to, you know, would you sell the company? Why would I sell the company? <laughs> it, it, this is not about how much money Jeremy Leffern can make. It's about how are you impacting people in a meaningful way? Like, and we do that tangibly, right? With just paycheck, but that's kind of empty. Like, yes, everybody needs the money. And it's, it's a very important thing. I don't mean to diminish, but when I think about like, I'm, I upholster, Okay, well, and I make money for that. Well, I make furniture that goes where you where it's useful. Okay, well, that's a kind of a next level. Well, I make furniture that kids use that changes their their environment. When I bring pictures in and show Joyce at a sewing machine, hey, remember you were working on this custom piece? Check this out. This is installed. Now her her work has even more meaning. And then you take it to the next level, and that's where we try to drive it home: is you are sewing or you're doing your job today to bless others. And again, it now you're getting a paycheck and you're rewarded in your soul. You're feeling like I have purpose beyond just a sweatshop making stuff. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I want to go to two places, which are usually taboo places. So if you want to go there, great. And if we don't, we want to cut this out, we can cut it out, but I think it would be an interesting conversation. Um, I struggle with the, so the, the two things are are going to be religion and money. That's what we're going to talk about. <laughs> Perfect. Love it. Um, so you're pretty open talking about, you know, talking about your faith and in the education world, you know, it, it's pretty like you can't go there. I mean, you literally, you just can't go there. There's laws against being able to go there. Um, I, I did not have like a deep religious upbringing. Like I grew up, Jewish. I've been going to church with my wife for 20 years. And um, I would say only until recently, just like really like the message, like it's really like resonating with me. I I personally am struggling of saying I can't openly go there, even though a lot of things we're doing is all about just serving others and loving others and, and, you know, and, and doing good. 
I don't even know how to phrase the question. Do you feel like there's a backlash? You feel like, like what makes you feel like you can openly talk about that? And maybe it's, this is me just having a big mental block of like not being authentic of like why, what, what drives me? No, it is. It is. A, it can be a challenge. You know, the way that we do it is, you know, I, I regularly say I want to be Christ to others. Christ was a living sacrifice, right? He was a sacrifice for us. He was the, the picture of love. You know, the, the Bible says what love is when a man lays down his life, his life for his friends. Okay, so in business, how do I do that? Well, I tell people, I, I just want to be Christ to you. I want to, being a Christian is being Christ. And what does that look like? Well, it's, you're, the, you're the biggest servant that's ever been, right? I'm trying to be as much of a servant, right? I'm not going to ask someone else to do something I would not be willing to do. And I'm going to serve by, we we have what we call our, our foam core foundations. And then we have 12 of them, one for each month. And one of them is carry up the hill. And the idea is that we don't want to be the puppeteer. That's not leadership. Sometimes we get that idea that leadership is, um, I stand in my, my tower and tell all the minions what to do. No, we're going to be Hacksaw Ridge, man. We're going to put you on my shoulder. I'm going to carry you where we're going. And that's who Christ was. And that's who Christ is. And so I think too, Kevin, the balance is I don't, I'm okay hiring people that don't have a faith walk. That's okay. We say that all the time. Our core values are based on Micah 6, 8, a Bible verse. I don't care what you think about it, but I am going to require that you're just kind and humble. So I think that's the balance too. It's like, that's okay to have a faith walk. I'm still going to be Christ to you and, or try to be. And I I think maybe that's the balance. Yeah. And and I think that's where, yeah, it's, it's how open with it, you know, and, and I, and I think the fact that you are like, yeah, I mean, it's very authentic um, in that way and the way that I'm still trying to figure out (laughs) how to do that because, because it, you know, it's, Yeah, at the end of the day, I don't care what religion people are, I, but I do care that, you know, to your point, like our core values of be the change, you belong here and listen, care and follow through is I, I but those are all there. There's nothing in conflict with kind of Judeo-Christian values with that. Right, right. And, it, and I have employees that will say, hey, you had this, you know, you had this activity or whatever, and I wasn't a part because I don't really want to be a part of that. but I really appreciate you did that. We every other Tuesday we have a lunch and lunch. And a lot of times it's like a minister or something like that that comes in. Now they're not preaching and they're not reading from the Bible. They're just talking about life skills. People who aren't even involved appreciate that. Um the other day, so we have I have on my shirt here, I'll show you. We have phone 23. That's our fulfill our mission. So each week we're working for a person or a charity. And um Jeff, my partner, after a staff meeting, we introduced Stacy, who's dealt with health problems and we're working for this lady who really needs help in our community. She's a friend of um, one of our employees, Shamika. And he just felt like after the meeting, hey, I'm going to pray for her. If you want to pray, come on over and pray with us. If you don't want to, you know, don't worry about it. And some people came over and they prayed for this person that we're working for. Other people left, which was totally fine, totally appropriate. It's what you're comfortable with. And I think people have found in our company, those things will happen. And there is no judgment on you if you don't participate. I think that's the key. It's like, it's totally okay. Um, But you know, it meant a lot to this person who we prayed for. And again, I had a couple guys, a couple gentlemen come up and say, you know, I, I didn't stay, but I want you to know, I appreciate that you cared enough to do that. And, and so it's a tricky walk. But I think keeping yeah. that judgment out and yeah. the requirement out and the proselytizing out and just saying, let me just be really, really kind. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah. I, I think it's an interesting point where we are kind of in like American culture right now, yeah. where where we're saying we want people to be authentic and show up as like their full selves. But then there's certain things are still like considered taboo or like you can't go there. You can't show yeah. that part of yourself. So I it, it, I just think it's interesting. I think it's uh well the benefit too, kind of bring it full circle to what we talked about. One of the reasons that money's not the driver is because of my faith. 
I really believe where God wants me to be is the best place to be. Right now, he has me here. And that's why we can be very generous to our employees to the point where, like you said, why, you know, how can you be a businessman and maybe not greedy and after money? Well, I really believe if I do it the right way and we end up losing money and going out of business, then I believe the Lord has something else for me. And that's okay. And that's where there's that shift in your brain where it doesn't have to drive money. In fact, it, it can't drive money. Yeah. 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 And I, and I think that's kind of that second part of this conversation of, of going to money is that most people, if you just said, how do you handle money? It's usually like, well, I'm going to spend it on me first. And then you know, like, may I'll pay taxes. Maybe I'll save a little bit. And then if there's anything left over, I'll, I'll kind of give it away to help others. Um, and, you know, and I've been really looking at, at that of saying like, well, can we flip that? And, you know, and this is stuff that, you know, like I'm from influences that I'm around of like, be like, yeah, it does kind of change that. You say like, wait, this isn't our money. We're just stewards of the money yes. for a short time. That if you flip it and say, what if the first priority is to help others with the money? Right. And then you, and then you save it for some security, then you pay your taxes. And then kind of what's left over at that point is, is kind of, you know, what we, you know, the profit or the pay or the bonuses or, you know, whatever it is that we can, we can share with our team. Um, and that's kind of the transition that we're going through. And it's, a, it's, a, yeah, it, it's one of those things where it, I don't even know how much to talk about it with, sure. but, but I, but it, it is at the heart of like why we're doing what we're doing. So I feel like maybe we should be talking about it. Well, and it, it is taboo and it's tough. And it, there is the balance as the, you know, the person who's making the decisions on where the money goes, right? It is the fuel that keeps it going. So you've got to be a good steward of, of how you use it. And um, you, you can't just give it all away every year and not market, for example. Or, you know, you, you do have to make wise decisions. The truth is, as we've grown, you recognize, man, if I'm a really good steward, I always say, you know, my my title is managing member, my title is CEO, but I'm really just the caretaker of a company. I'm the caretaker. When I was coaching soccer at high school for 15 years, I loved that an athletic director I had. He said to me one time, you are the caretaker of this. And I love that idea because that means you're going to hand it to someone else someday. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, instead of that idea that this is mine, it's not yeah. mine. It's not what I've done. It's these people around me. It's what they have done. And I, I think that helps. But back to the money part. I, money is that funny thing that it can be a motivator, but I have found you could pay somebody a ton of money and never give them a word of affirmation and tell them you did a great job and it would, they won't stay. You could pay somebody a fair wage and, you know, praise them mm -hmm. and show them, you know, we give an MVP each week where the peers nominate someone who's showed our core values. They get to come out up front. That person has that trophy on their workstation or whatever, those things matter, yeah. you know? And I, so I think it's that balance of, yeah, you want people to know you're generous. And I do think you're generous with your people first. I do. Yeah. I think you got to start there. Yeah. Well, um, I think, I, well, I think this is an interesting topic too, because we have a, we have a good chunk of school leaders that listen to this. Obviously we have, you know, a lot of people in the design architecture world with a friendly, but then with our affiliation with this education leaders organization, there's a lot of school leaders that really their, their task is to kind of be that caretaker for, for the district. And, um, but they, but it, it's a big role and they're handcuffed in a lot of ways, but I do think there needs to be more of this discussion within their leadership um, because, sure. you know, like right now, like, yeah, money, money is always going to be like a big force within the education system. And, you know, no matter how much is there, it's, it's never going to be enough. So it does require kind of the leadership to bring more purpose to it. And, and it's very similar to a business, right? And yeah. you, have, you have this in a lot of ways, they're the biggest businesses in their you know, in their cities, their towns, or their local yeah. communities. Man, if and I if I could encourage them with anything, it would be this. Everybody in my company, and I know it's a small company, they know what our mission is. And they know our three core values. Very simple. 
man, does everybody in that district know what your mission is? And is your mission big enough that yes, the money is important and yes, you're going to deal with unions and collective bargaining and those things. I know, but is your mission big enough that, that you can manage those things? Because the ones that I have seen here locally that are, this is our mission. They're the ones that do well and get through hard times and get through those struggles. And it's the same with business. The businesses that make it have, have a team of people that are willing to be bigger than the money. Although again, it's this big driver. It's that balance. Yeah. Well, we're coming up in that half hour mark. Okay. What, anything I didn't ask you that I should be asking about any topic we didn't go to, we didn't explore yet. No, I mean, yes, there's a million things we're talking about. <laughs> but, um, no, I just, I, I would just close with, you know, when you care about people, and that's what education is about. It's about caring about these kids. And sometimes you're just like our company. Sometimes you're the only people in their lives who, or maybe the, the students feel that way. Maybe my employees feel that way. You might be the only one who comes in that safe realm. You have quite a responsibility. And that's what I love about what you do with outfitting schools and changing that the thinking on how we can reach these kids creating this environment that's just this fun, safe, I care about you as a human being. I think that's that's the driver in humanity that crosses across all of this, whether it's you're the, the superintendent or you're the CEO of K-12 or the CEO of Foam Corps. Are you coming around just to be Christ to people? Are you just trying to let me bless you? How can I bless you today? Oh, man transformational it really yeah, is yeah well thanks for going there with me uh, yeah. To, yeah i mean for the listeners I, I felt like this would be a good conversation to, to get to know kind of the people behind the industry there are just so many good people that want to do this want to do good and uh and sometimes um and, and not everyone so i hate to kind of put this generalization but sometimes we're viewed of because you know, if we're a for-profit company that we're all about just trying to make money and kind of get the most out of, you know, like most money away from districts, that's, that's not the case. Like there are some really great people and companies yeah. that, that want to partner with you. And, and there are in this industry, like I said before, you'll, you'll find them. Um, and when you do, you hold on to them because uh, those are the partners you want to have for sure. Yeah. So I mean, the last thing, if, if, uh, you're not a subscriber, just hit subscribe wherever you're listening to. And then if you go to betterlearningpodcast.com, um, there is a survey that we have on there um, that we want to try to make it this way. This isn't just talk. Um, there's different ways. If you go through that, it kind of aligns um, kind of your interests and your gifts and trying to have some action behind this of trying to say, here's some suggestions of different ways that we can work together, do that. So, but Jeremy, thank you. It's always, always great talking to you. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it, Kevin. The views and opinions expressed on the Better Learning Podcast are those of myself as an individual and my guests and do not necessarily represent the organizations that we work for, the Association for Learning Environments, K-12, Education Leaders Organization, or Second Class Foundation. 